Welcome to Westminster. Welcome to Westminster. Welcome to Westminster. Welcome to Westminster. Well, welcome to Worship with Westminster. I'm Pastor Chris Ward. As always, we are glad you are here with us today as together we come to God's word. So thanks for joining with us as we begin our time together. Would you pray with me? Lord God, as always, uh, we pray that you come meet us where we are. Uh, Lord, we know that you know us by name and that you invite us to know you by name. So Lord, uh, help us to sense your presence, hear your voice, and to follow you in obedience uh, for the good of this world. We pray this all in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, let's worship God. So there's this kind of call and response greeting that often begins church services around the world. The, the leader starts with the simple phrase, God is good, and the congregation responds with the declaration all the time. And then the leader switches and says all of the time, and the congregation says, God is good. You know, I remember sitting in a, a worship service surrounded by people coming from really difficult situations, uh, and, and then engaging in that greeting process. And I remember the change in their bodies as they engaged this truth. Like, you know, we could have just done the benediction and gone home because that was all they needed to remember that God is good all of the time. And I think most of the time we too could join together in that simple declaration and believe that we believe it until, of course, we don't. See, in worship, we come before a God who is always with us, who is always faithful, a God who always sees us, who knows us, who loves us without limits. And we all know that, right? We, we agree with that. We know it's true up here. But what about when it doesn't feel like it's true? What about when our situations get hard and our hearts are broken and it just feels like the weight of the world is upon us and that God just doesn't care that he isn't there for us well, what happens to worship then well this is the realm of lament lament is a huge part of the psalms of the 150 psalms that make up the book of psalms the vast majority that 60 psalms are actually categorized as psalms of lament and that doesn't even count the psalms that fit into different categories but still contain elements of lament if you add those in, then two-thirds of the psalms deal with lament. So lament was obviously an important part of Israel's worship because pain and suffering and hardship have always been a, a part of real life, a part of the human experience. And Israel, in being honest and authentic with God in their worship, brought their whole selves before him, including their hurts. Just lament is just part of being human. I mean, you don't remember it, but your first sound on this earth was a cry of lament, a bold cry declaring to the world, Wah, something's not right. right. Nobody had to teach you to cry. It was a natural response to this shocking experience, going from a place of warmth and safety and tranquility into a bright, cold, hard room, a broken world. Who are these people and what are they doing to me? Of course, if all is right then that feeling of distress that the infant first feels is immediately followed by soothing and comfort by the presence of the loving parents who provide safety and support. I mean, this is the far side of lament. This is what God ultimately actually intends for us, that our lament, our cries, are, are met and soothed by the presence of a loving, always there, always faithful God. But still... To lament is to be human. It's simply a part of our story, and that means that it should be a part of our worship as well. Unfortunately, as Americans, we tend to be really bad at lament. I mean, we like to be good at everything, but, but we're not very good at this. We can be actually almost pathological in our attempts to ignore or skip past the hard parts of life and pretend that suffering isn't real. We just numb the pain, you know, drink more wine, play more games, watch more videos so that we can get to the good stuff because we're also all supposed to live the good life, right? It's all supposed to be green grass and white picket fences and high-speed internet and happiness. 
That's, that's follow your bliss stuff, right? It's actually baked into our American DNA from our very inception as a nation, from the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, like, come on, everybody knows this stuff, that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of what? Happiness. Right? Equality, liberty, happiness. This is owed to me. It's unalienable. So we are profoundly uncomfortable being around grief and sorrow and lament. It just doesn't fit into our worldview. It doesn't fit our, our expectations for what life is meant to be or for who we are meant to be. But once again, like with remembrance and thanksgiving last week, I believe that in order for us to be healthy, well-adjusted human beings... We really need to come to grips with lament as a practice, that speaking our pain, both in our personal lives and in our life together, needs to be something we get good at. Now, that's not easy, and I know that all too well. I will humbly confess that I'm actually not very good at lament myself. We need to encourage each other to do this better as a community. And yet, when we do embrace lament... And how God relates to us in our pain and how God's community meets us in our pain. We find some actually really important truths. That all of our life matters to God. And that we are heard and are actually healed by God as we lament. And of course, finally, most importantly, we are not alone. God is with us no matter where we find ourselves. And of course, I, I want to hold to, uh, 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 or want us to hold on to the fact that all of our lament actually exists within a framework, within boundaries that are set in place by the redemptive work of God through Jesus Christ. If you follow any hurt far enough, you will still find that the sovereign and loving and redemptive presence of God is right there. And that doesn't mean that we ignore the hurt that we feel along the way. But we also need to recognize and celebrate that our hurt does not get the last word. And because it doesn't get the last word, that gives us the freedom then to speak it, to name it, to not be afraid of it. We don't need to be afraid of sorrow or lament because sorrow and lament will be redeemed. So let's go ahead and take a look at one of those many psalms of lament. If you would turn... Uh, in your Bibles or turn on your Bible app with me to Psalm 22. Of course, I'll have the words on the screen for you. And so you might be thinking, well, why do I need to bother to get out my device or my Bible then? It seems like extra work. But you know, our lives are actually built on a foundation of habit. And each one of us should get to the point where going to God's word is normal. It's a habit that we just do all the time. It's just a helpful exercise. Right? We just open up the word and there it is, God speaking to us. So, to practice your hands getting used to coming to God's Word, go ahead and pull out your device or pull out your Bible and turn to Psalm 22 and let's look at it together. We'll pause and kind of walk our way through some of the pieces as we go through, although with this being Communion Sunday, I'll, I'll try to keep it short-ish. One final caution, though, before we come to the Word. Uh, as Christians, we tend to read this particular Psalm 22. We, we, we read this Psalm first and foremost through the experience of Jesus. After all, Jesus quoted this psalm, uh, the opening of the psalm, from the cross. And if you work through the gospel accounts of the crucifixion, I think you find something like 20 direct references or parallels uh, to this psalm. The mocking, the pierced hands, the gambling for the clothes, all of this. It's, it's really easy to just say, this is a psalm for Jesus. But we need to remember that before it was a psalm for Jesus, it was a psalm for David. That this was, uh, this yes, Psalm prophetically points towards Jesus, but it was a, the cry of an actual person in history before then from his experience of pain. This was a cry from David's pain. And that it actually became then part of Israel's cry that was embedded in Israel's worship for over a thousand years before Jesus came. You know, who knows how many average, ordinary Israelites cried out this psalm in the midst of their own pain and suffering and loss. When Jesus entered into these words upon the cross, he actually was also entering into the very real lives, the very real suffering of his people. And that's good news because that means it's good news for us too. He enters into our experiences as well. 
So with that in mind, are you ready to hear from the living God? If so, listen. Psalm 22. To the choir master, according to the doe of the dawn, a psalm of David. So first of all, does anybody know the tune to the doe of the dawn? Because uh, if so, let me know. I'd love to hear it. Uh, most of us would say, well, no, we don't know what that is because it's been lost to history. But, and so because of that, we tend to skip past the, the, what's called the, the superscription and just get to the good stuff, thinking that the other stuff is irrelevant. But actually, you can learn a lot from that first line. What does this tell us? It tells us that this prayer was actually sung as Israel's worship, that this prayer is now accessible to anybody who has felt abandoned by God who suffers and feels alone. Not just David, not just Jesus. It's available to you. Right? David's story became part of our collective story, which then becomes part of my story. If you could open up your mouth and sing, this psalm is for you. So, what is that story? Verse 1 for us. In Hebrew, it's actually verse 2. but Verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. So Psalm 22 actually follows a five-part structure that is common for most of the Psalms of Lament. First of all, we hear the address, which we just read. And notice in the address that David still says, My God. So worship since this is a psalm series or series on the psalms and how they relate to worship, worship is first and foremost about relationship. And David starts this psalm by emphasizing that relationship. This is a dialogue. This is a conversation with his God whom he expects to be there listening. Even if God isn't speaking, he expects God to be listening. So he starts his address with a relationship. Uh, the part two is, is the lament or the complaint, although I need to define the difference between a complaint or a lament and complaining, uh, which is a different thing. Complaining comes from a place of pride, like, you owe me and now I'm going to grumble about it. Uh, well, lament or this complaint, formally term, uh, is, is the expression from a place of humility and dependence that something's wrong. So uh, that, the, the complaint or the lament is then followed by the third movement, which is the petition or prayer, the request, would you do this, followed by the expression of trust and confidence in God, and finally the fifth part of the, the five-part uh, structure, a vow to praise God. And you see those elements represented in, throughout most of the psalms of lament, and they're certainly here in this psalm as well. We'll look at them later. But notice that all of those other four elements are rooted in the first element, the relationship. They're rooted in the assumption of a relationship with a personal God who cares. So let's just go ahead and get personal. How close are you to God? I mean, this is different from knowing that God exists or even believing in God. No, do you know that God loves you personally? Do you talk with him enough that you feel comfortable to carry your baggage into his presence? I mean, do you feel okay? Do you feel safe bringing up your junk, your pain, your brokenness, your doubts, your hurt into God's presence? By the way, he knows it anyway, so don't think you can hide it. But do you feel comfortable speaking that? Do you go to God and say, God, this stinks. This is not right. Can you do that? Do you expect that God wants to hear you and to act on your behalf? Is God for you my God? In fact, can we just say that together? Just those two words, my God. My God. Say it again. My God. Now, he is, by the way, if you will let him be your God. And that is the heart of lament. It all falls apart if that's not true. But there is a God who cares, and he's there. Verse 3. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. So David remembers Israel's history like we were talking about last week. God has saved them before. He can do it again. 
But here we also see the contrast that's inherent in the complaint. God's character and identity is that he has been faithful in the past, but that is contrasted now with his seeming to be absent in the present. God, David says, God, this isn't like you. And so he's, he swings back and forth between expressions of trust and expressions of hurt. Verse 6, but I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who seek me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. I know that sounds a little confusing, but you see the back and forth between trust and hurt that continues. Verse 9, yet you are he whom took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. Now, there's a lot of poetic imagery here, including lots of animal imagery, because, you know, if you don't have steel cars or guns, then animals can actually be pretty scary, right? You and, and, and a bull alone in a field together, you're no longer looking at a source of steak. You're looking at a one-ton creature who can absolutely wreck you, and he doesn't even have to use his horns to do it. And Bashan was known for its extra big and scary bulls, I guess. So danger, danger is what we hear in. He goes on, they open their wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me down in the dust of death. So uh, French philosopher Simone Weil, uh, in her book, The Love of God and Affliction, wrote that affliction can be separated into three basic categories, physical, psychological, and social. David described all of them, right? Lament encompasses the totality of suffering in every part of our human life. It might be individual, as we read here, or lament for the brokenness of our culture. You might lament for our own life circumstances or for the pain that you see around you. Whatever the source of pain, though, it, it just keeps building, we see. It just keeps building. You feel the pressure on David building as he continues to share his feelings before God. For dogs encompass me, he says. Not, not in a good way. This is not pets with tails wagging. No, this is dogs biting and scavenging, tearing. A company of e evildoers encircles me. They've pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So for, for the vast majority of this psalm, David has been describing in dramatic and poetic detail, using intense imagery, his own situation and how he feels. My God, my God, this is what's going on. This is how I feel. So let's just pause for a moment and talk about the purpose of lament and why I think it's so incredibly important that we practice it. But first, a question. Does God already know all the details that, that David has been sharing? I mean, has, God, has David filled God in on something that somehow God didn't know? Well, no, of course not. We, we understand that God knows all of this already because God well, knows everything, including our thoughts, something that we find declared even throughout the rest of the book of Psalms. In fact, some of the Psalms explicitly, as Psalms of Lament, explicitly actually say, God, you know all of this. You know what's going on. But then they say it anyway. Knowing why they say it anyway is an important part of understanding the purpose and the benefit of lament. And in fact, just contrast all of what David's already said, the, the vast majority of the verses of this Psalm that have been uh, a detailed lament with the next three verses that form the entirety of the petition or the request portion of the psalm. Verse 19, But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of wild oxen. So 18 verses of detailed lament and three short verses of very general request. 
David knows that he doesn't actually need to tell God what to do because God already knows what to do. Come, deliver, save, that, that pretty much covers it. So why all of those verses then detailing the lament? God knew that stuff too. But what is it the lament is accomplishing? So lament is an acknowledgement of what is broken and also a process of working that through, praying through how we feel about it in the safety of God's presence. And the process of lament actually brings change. No, no, um, not so much change in the, in the situation, though sometimes that's true in a secondary aspect, but the primary result of lament is transformation in the one who's lamenting. When we lament, as in many kinds of prayer, we are opening ourselves to the transforming and redemptive power of God working in us, while also asking God to work upon the world. But it always starts in us. So what does that look like? Well, for starters, it's kind of like a safety valve, a much-needed way of relieving intense pressure upon our soul and reconnecting us to, well, to community, to God, and to healthy perspective. So when I was in seminary, I was working at a part-time uh, youth position at a church in the suburb of, of Pittsburgh. And this church was just so good, so generous to Julie and to me. Uh, we had nothing as a couple. I mean, we were just married, and, and we came to Pittsburgh like with nothing in our bank account. Um, but a couple of church members at this church, also some of our most faithful parent volunteers, just decided to give us a house to live in while we were in seminary. Now, they had bought this older house that they planned to renovate for their growing family, but instead they put their, fam their family plans on hold and gave this house to us for free, rent-free, for five years. It was an older house, though, and it came with some issues. So Pittsburgh sometimes gets a lot of rain, especially during hurricane season when the, you know, the storms down south would batter the coast and then they'd move up inland and cause tornadoes and torrential rain in our area. And one season was just worse than usual with storm after storm turning our backyard into a growing pond. And one day we were sitting in the living room and we heard this loud pop from downstairs and, uh, in the basement. And, and when I went down to check it out, I could hear the sound of running water. I thought maybe a pipe had burst or something, and, and when I got down the stairs, I saw that there was actually a huge crack in the cement wall facing our backyard, including a hole just a few feet up from the floor that was now a spout of water shooting several feet into the middle of the room, as if somebody stuck a garden hose through our wall. So what did I do? Well, we just happened to have some cinder blocks down in the basement, and so I shoved a couple rags into the hole and pressed the cinder block against it, except that the force of the water was so strong that it just spat out the rag and actually pushed the cinder block across the floor. So my answer? Well, more cinder blocks, of course. So I stuffed the rag back in and, and started piling the cinder blocks in bricks, and, and eventually I, I just piled so much heavy stuff that I thought I had conquered the leak, and I went back upstairs. Came back down just a little while later to find that the, the basement had a solid six inches of water in it, and the water was now running out the garage, the, underneath the garage door and into the, into the driveway. And the leak was still spouting. <laughs> and that became a battle for me over the next week or so as the storms continued to roll through. I, you know, I was determined to fix this by myself. So I went to the hardware store and I got some of that special aquatic mortar and tried to fill the hole and to stuff it in there and then to pile the bricks again and let it set. Um, I got some waterproof sealer paint because there were minor drips starting uh, throughout the rest of the wall. Yeah, like somehow paint is going to fix this yeah, problem. But I just kept piling stuff against it to solve the problem as if more weight is going to solve the problem. It's, it's okay, you, you can laugh. You know, I, I, at the time, I was writing deeply scholarly papers and working on high-level theological topics and, you know, in, in Greek and Hebrew and, and taking part in debates that demonstrated supposedly high levels of intelligence, only I really wasn't very smart. <laughs> I mean, I can, admit, I can admit that now. So what was the problem? Uh, what was I missing? I, I mean, I know I was missing a lot there, but what was the big problem that I was missing? See, the problem wasn't a hole in the wall. That was just a symptom of the problem. The problem was that there was an incredible weight of water, a, glowing, a growing lake of water in the backyard pushing against the foundation of the house. 
It wasn't just that we would have a persistent leak that would keep our basement wet. It's that we actually had a serious problem that could have destroyed the entire house. It wasn't about fixing the hole, it was about draining the pond that threatened the entire structure. You know, so often when we deal with our hurts, when we deal with our pain, we try to fix the holes. We address the symptoms of our pain and the loss and our traumas where they're poking through into our regular lives. You know, we address the places where our hurts and our baggage are leaking onto the floor, but we forget that there's actually a lake of pressure behind it pushing against the very foundations of who we are that could destroy the whole house. That pressure will not be ignored. Eventually, it's going to break through. You know, our feelings are powerful, and stuffing them just doesn't help. The pressure keeps building. The rain keeps falling, and even if it's from different sources, different storms that roll through our lives, so long as the general water has nowhere else to go, it's just going to keep building. The water presses into the very foundations of our soul. So can we just pause for a moment and ask, what's pushing on you? What griefs, what pains, what, what losses are pushing against your foundations right now? It might be something personal. You know, a personal loss, an illness, a diagnosis, a struggle, a broken relationship, a doubt, something in your life is pressing against you. Or it might be the pain from someone you love. Right? Seeing others suffer and struggle, it takes its toll on us as well. It might even be for people you don't even know. You know we can carry the pain of a culture around, this sense that you know, something's not right, and I hate to see people in pain. I'm grieved by it. What is it that's putting pressure on your soul right now? Now, we need to have ways to process that pain as a people, as a people of faith. And just plugging the hole, as I mentioned, it's not going to work. But the other danger, perhaps, is to just keep on pouring cement down in the basement. Just fill the whole, the whole basement up with cement. That would certainly stop the leak, right? It would just end up filling the, the basement so full nothing else could be there just a hardened a hardened rock, right? I mean, distancing yourself from the pain for too long, it actually doesn't just distance you from pain. It ends up distancing you from everything, every kind of feeling, even joy. All of the other feelings are shut out as you just become rigid. Scripture actually mentioned this, mentions this as well and, and calls it hardening one's heart. You become dead inside. You can no longer hear or feel the heart of God. Lament actually can break that open to say, I've been holding back the weight of these feelings and now I'm letting them go. And that can be terrifying because you feel like you might get swept away in the process. But you know, just keeping to shove mortar in the wall or pile bricks against the, 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 the edge of your soul is not going to be enough. There's just too much at stake here. We don't have the resources to face down the pain and brokenness of our life or let alone of the whole world on our own. So lament calls us to come together, to share the story, to get it out, and to find healing. Lament relieves pressure in a healthy way. It, it begins the process of draining, draining the emotional pond that's pushing against us. You know, the, the tears that are cried in lament and sorrow when they're collected and studied in a laboratory, those tears are actually found to, to contain uh, stress hormones and other wastes that are produced in grief. Li that means that literally your tears are flushing those things out of your body. It's, it's really good for the whole system, actually. You know, lament gives the body a kind of a rest and a reset. I mean, have you ever had like a really good cry and afterwards you feel like there's been a weight that's been lifted? Like you're actually better able to face the hard things that were causing you such distress a little while ago? Lament is cathartic. You know, it helps us to bring our emotions down to a level of health once more. We, we know that there are things in, the, in our world and in our lives that are not where they're supposed to be, and lament helps us to process through that, come back to a place of health. Lament is healing. Lament is empowering. You know, therapists actually finding that helping people, especially victims of trauma, to lament, to name their pain, actually reconnects them with a sense of purpose that they actually feel more able to make a change in themselves and actually in their world as well. Naming what happened and how they feel, to verbally acknowledge that this was wrong and declaring even the injustice of it, that was wrong, that person did wrong. That this was not what should have been. 
provides a level of freedom and empowerment that helps them move past merely feeling like a victim. Lament by expressing what is broken about God's world aligns us with how God's world is actually supposed to be, which in turn often leads to action, whether to oppose the brokenness that we have seen or to help others who have been wounded. Historically, lament has often been at the heart of movements of individuals and groups and even whole societies who decide to change their reality. Right? The, the, the abolition of slavery began with lament. So many things, so many ways that we've changed our culture begins with first lamenting that this is wrong, and then we find the power to do something about it. Isolated people coming together in their pain and finding freedom to move for change. We actually see a little bit of this in the rest of David's psalm, which I'm not going to read because I feel like we don't have the time. No, actually, I'm going to read it. I will tell of your name... To my brothers in the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship before him, shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. One last little bit here. We find that in our lament, God is actually right there. He was there all along. And now it's okay to put back on the the Jesus perspective as we close out our time. Jesus entered into this lament in a way that, that... just shatters all of the other laments, in in fact, as well. By not just suffering with us, Jesus suffered for us, that our suffering could be guaranteed to come to an end. Even the one who could not keep himself alive shall give glory to God. You know, Jesus could not keep himself alive. I mean, he could have, but he chose not to. Why? Because he wanted to keep you alive. And that final verse, he has done it. You know, in in the Hebrew, that last phrase could also be translated, it has been done. Or even, it is finished. Friends, there's a lot of pain in this world. There might be a lot of pain in your life. You don't have to face it alone. You should not face it alone. It will destroy you if you face it alone. But you have a God who stands with you. And by his grace, you also have a community, a family of faith who stands with you. You are not alone. And lament will not have the last word. Name it. Name it, get it out, release the pressure, and know that God, in his great mercy, will put an end to it. Amen.
You are. 